initiated by the host. You can adjust your view setting for speaker view or gallery view. The speaker will take limited questions during the presentation using the chat text fixed feature. To ask a question, find the chat text icon, depending on your format, either with a direct icon or three dots with quotations around them, underneath it says more. Chat text directly with Pedro. After the presentation, Pedro will take limited questions and pick from chat text submissions. After the presentation, question and answer session, our LBVBS meeting will start. LBVBS will compile a list of email addresses for those of you who want to participate in future meetings. If you would like to receive an announcement of our future meetings, please email your name and email address to the BL plantman um, at gmail.com and in the reference line, put Zoom. Uh, Barry Landau will keep track of all of you. And thank you, Barry. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Pedro Nahum for his time and effort to make this Zoom presentation for us tonight. Mr. Nahum is the CEO of Botanica Pop Brazil. He grew up on a farm growing native plants at an early age. He studied botany at the University of Sao Paulo and became a Bachelor of, Eco of Ecology at UFRJ. He is a biodiversity management student to become a specialist by the National School of Tropical Botany. <clears throat> Pedro started his own germplasm bank in 1989, as in been working on conservation and genetic improvement of native species in Brazil. For over 25 years, he has worked for conservation, cultivation, propagation of sun-tolerant bromeliads. He has a strong interest in the genus Ananas, pineapples, and other genera, as you will soon see. Pedro is an author, speaker, businessman, father, and a lot more. Let me welcome Mr. Pedro Nahum. Okay. Good evening. Uh, it's a big pleasure for me to be here. Hi, Bromeliad people. I would like to say that uh, it's a big honor for me. Thanks for the Bromeliad Society of La Balona Valley. Thanks, Barry Landau, Ken, Paul, Tom, everybody that made lots of efforts for us to be here. And it's a big pleasure for me to, to introduce you in our work in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro and the uh, Atlantic Coast area. And I'm gonna show you my, my story and uh, my, my experience in, in breeding bromeliads and use them in landscape here. Paul, do you see a screen? I can only see the Zoom screen. We're not seeing your presentation. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to. Okay, there we go. Turn it. <clears throat> it's opening. Just a minute. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Now you. Now you're on. Okay. So perfect. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about bromeliads and and uh, a little bit about bromeliads in nature and a little bit about uh, bromeliads in cultivation and in landscaping. So I, I started very early with plants when I was uh, 14 years old. Now I'm 49, and. Uh, I, I was very lucky because I, I met lots of important people from from all over Americas and uh, mainly from Brazil, and they gave me lots of knowledge and experience on that. So in in uh, 1986, I was 15 years old, and I started to grow ferns 
and trees from Atlantic Forest. My family uh, had farm in, near, near Rio, in, in the Rio de Janeiro metropolitan area. So I grew up with animals, wild animals and, and plants and loving them and uh, understanding how to deal with them. And in, when I was 15 years old, I started to grow the plants. In, in a few years, my father got from a, an old friend of him, uh, the director of the Botanical Garden of Niterói County, Domingos, uh, an old friend of Bullemax. He got a collection of, of native landscape bromeliads in 1988, including Acmea, Alcantarea, Ananas, Dike, Ortofaito, Neurogelia, and Portea. And that was very important for me because it was a complete collection of, of the landscape plants, and I start to, to grow them and understand them. And all, almost all of these uh, genus, uh, except by Orthophyton, uh, occurs in our, our uh, county of Marica County, including, including uh, Dike Pseudococcinia, an endangered species from the Hestinga. And uh, in, the, in the next year, I went to study biology in uh, Sao Paulo University. And I had the, the great lucky, uh, luck to, to have the Dr. Nanusa Menezes as a teacher. She was a friend and the teacher of Roberto Burle Marx in botany. And we traveled a lot. And he teach me a lot about the wild plants he was, he's, she's a, a, an specialist, the, the, a world famous specialist in, in uh, anatomy and botany and mainly in, in Velociaceae family, uh, a native family of, of plants related to, to monopods. And uh, after that, I, I moved my, my graduate course to, to Rio de Janeiro. And in, in 1991, I was really lucky to, to meet Elton Lemmy and Luis Carlos de Marigo, the most important people of, of Bromelia uh, in Brazil during that time. And uh, I, I had a, a Toyota four-wheel drive, and uh, I was a part of their trips around the Rio, Bahia, Minas Gerais, Espírito Santo, Sao Paulo and other places to, to take pictures and to study the, the wild species to the very uh, important book, this book here, Bromeliads in Brazilian Wilderness. So Elton teach me most of, of the things that I know about the wild species, bromeliaceae in nature, many things about uh, biology of bromeliads and stuff. And Marigo was a great friend and one of the best Brazilian pho photographers. And uh, we did many trips together. So I, I was very lucky to, to meet him, met them in, in that time. After that, I finished my, my graduate course in biology and I went to Europe to visit uh, some traditional families that grew bromeliads there, like a Bach family and the Roos family in 1993. And in 1994, with the help of my friend Dennis Katzkar from Tropic, Florida, from Sarasota, Florida, we made a tour in Florida and California, meeting lots of people there. And after that, we went down to Guatemala, Costa Rica, Venezuela, and Colombia. To, and I, I had the opportunity to, to meet two guys that are great, great friends of mine, and uh, the best breeder and the best grower of Bromelias that I ever met, Chester Skutek, the best man of my first wedding, and Franz Gruber, the, the German guy that lives in Colombia. Now she, he's a Brazilian citizen also. He has nursery in, in Colombia and Brazil. And these guys, they, they teach me a lot how to breed and grow Bromelias. So uh, Brazil is a giant country, we have many different biomes, and in all of these biomes we have a big diversity of bromeliaceae. 
but I'm, I'm located nearby Rio. We have two farms, one in uh, very close to Rio, 40 kilometers east of Rio de Janeiro city limits, and the other one, uh, 250 kilometers up north uh, in Kissaman County. And uh, just in these places, we have uh, many different ecosystems that where we can find bromeliads. And I was focused in uh, open habitats and uh, to, to, to find some tolerant species because I, I was in love with landscaping also during my, my uh, early uh, age, I was thinking in, in being an architect. So I was a kind of a biologist that uh, loves architecture and landscaping. And uh, at the same time, during that, that uh, period, we were uh, having lots of problems with the impact of extractivism in the, the wild populations of Bromeliaceae in Brazil because, uh, because of the tradition of Roberto Burnemarx and the beauty and the perennial color and the strong, vibrant colors of bromeliads and their beautiful shapes, they was a success in the tropical landscaping around Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo in the beginning of the 90s. But the problem uh, was that we didn't have growers. We have a few orchid growers that used to grow a little bit of blooming potted bromeliads like uh, Guzmanian, Virgin, and Ancmaeus, some Neragelia carolinae. But uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't have uh, growers of landscape variety, big sun tolerant species. And uh, it was an old tradition tradition in the world for that. I mean, uh, during that time, uh, Bullis nursery in, in Homestead in Florida, of the great uh, people, great uh, Bromelian people there, Harvey and Patricia, uh, they were growing Bromelians in, in, in Florida. But we, we didn't have a, a, an established uh, tradition for landscaping Bromelians. And we had a lot of impacts because some uh, bad people, illegal people, went to the wild, to Inselberg mountains, and to Hestinga vegetation. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about ecosystems, but they went with their, to, to that places and they stole them. They stole the, the, the wild plants to sell as landscaping plants. And I was worried about that because that was, was uh, promoting a big impact in some uh, uh, wild population, populations of, of, of Brazilian bromeliads. And I was thinking and start to grow them, to offer cultivated plants, legalized plants to supply the market. And at the same time, we started the Brazilian Bromeliad Society with lots of efforts of uh, Elton Lamy and Roberto Menescal, a great guy, a great musician, and uh, one of the most important uh, Bromelian people ever. And uh, the late uh, Luis Felipe Carvalho, the, our first president that helped a lot to establish the Brazilian Bromelian Society. And the Brazilian Bromelian Society, uh, what, that uh, I had the honor to be the first uh, conservation biology director. It has the purpose of to promote the horticulture, bromeliad horticulture, but at the same time, the bromeliad conservation. And uh, we, we did a lot to help the government with, with new laws about uh, biodiversity pro uh, protection. And at the same time, we introduced the bromeliads to nurserymen and growers. And in a few years, the most impact species like Alcantaria, Imperialis, and Aikmea blanquetiana came from nurseries other than the wild. And now I, we can say that it's a, a small problem compared with other Brazilian plants that are suffering a lot for, from extractivism, mainly Chilensia genus. So in Brazil, we have 
many different biomes and vegetation. And uh, we are focused in, in the open vegetation along the Atlantic coast, like this thin purple uh, area of Hestinga vegetation that it's called here uh, coast ecosystem, mainly mangroves and Hestinga, mangroves uh, on the boundary of, of fresh and uh, ocean water and Hestinga in the, in the sand nearby the, the seashore. And uh, we, we all, were also uh, searching for rupestrial uh, fields on the, on the high altitudes of Minas Gerais, Bahia, and Goiás states. It's not well represented here because it's a part of the Cerrado vegetation in the cream color here. But the herbestrial fields are a specific ecosystem, uh, hockey ecosystem that we're going to talk about. Another, another ecosystem very important for bromeliaceae in, in landscaping in Brazil are the Inselbergs mountains. We're going to talk about them. And Inselbergs, they came from the south up, up to the north. They are uh, all over the world, but we have in Brazil the biggest concentration of, of, of insulbergs on earth. And another one very important here in orange is the Caatinga vegetation, vegetation, the dry forest of the northeastern Brazil. So we have uh, the first one, very important, where I have the farm that grow bromelias on the sand is the Hestinga vegetation a kind of open ecosystem found in sandy soil near to the coast where we can, we can find uh, the very famous Neuragelia cruenta and other species that we're gonna, gonna see. The rupestrian fields vegetation, mainly in Minas Gerais state, north of Rio. There are open ecosystems found in high altitude hot soils in Cerrado. We have big areas in Bahia also, like uh, Chapada Diamantino National Park. And we have very important areas for Dica and Bromelia, genus, uh, in, in Goiás State, where we can see the beautiful Chapada dos Viadeiros National Park. The other vegetation that are important for us to search for uh, wild species that are sun tolerant is Caatinga vegetation from the northeastern open ecosystems in dry semi-arid regions of the northeastern where we have many different kinds of soil and uh, but all of them under a very hot sun, very low humidity and just a few rains all over the year. And the last very important where the, the, the place where I grew up because it's uh, very typical from the mountains of Rio de Janeiro city, like the Sugarloaf, are the Inselbergs. The Inselbergs are uh, very old volcanic, volcanic island mountains. The, 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 the word Inselberg in, 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 in Dutch, in Germany uh, language, is uh, island mountain mountains, the tra translation. So, Inselbergs, uh, they, they appear as a true island in the Atlantic coast. We have a beautiful island, including the Trindad Island, uh, 1,000 kilometers inside the ocean to the east in the direction of Africa. But along the, the Atlantic forest, ma mainly in the Atlantic forest, but also in Caatinga and also in some parts of the Rupestral fields, we find many inselbergs. And these rocky surfaces made of granite or gneiss rock, uh, they are perfect for some genera, genera of, of bromeliaceae, like uh, Chilenzia and mainly Alcantaria. Alcantaria, almost all of, of the species of Alcantaria occurs in, in Inselbergs. And I, I was a climber in the beginning of the 90s, 
and I was studying them because in, in Rio we have a big diversity of species in Inselberg. So uh, we have cities where we can find many, many Inselbergs inside the cities, like in Rio de Janeiro, in Niterói, but also in uh, Pedra Azul from Spirit Santo State, from Pedra Azul for, from Minas Gerais State, from Milagres in Bahia, Quixadá in Ceará State, Patos in Paraíba State. And uh, not all of them are protected as a conservation unit. So we are still working to search for new species and to fight to make these places uh, conservation units of the Brazilian government. For an example, these two uh, Inselbergs uh, from the north of Rio de Janeiro state, they are not protected yet. And in this place, this year, early this year, uh, me and Dr. Leonardo Vessier uh, go into the field to, to study wild bromides for his new book, his, his new uh, English edition, edition of, of his Alcantarea book. We found a new species of Alcantarea, Alcantarea intermedia. Uh, so it's very important for us to fight against extractivism because people are going to these places to steal wild chilenses and uh, some of them are very endemic and uh, we need to fight for new conservation units. This place is, is between uh, the two counties that where, where I live, Niterói and Maricá, east of Rio, inside the metropolitan area. This picture, beautiful picture, is of the Serra da Tiririca State Park, took from, from my, my good friend, the biologist, Isaac Aksimov. And uh, this place is, is some of the places that, where we can find many bromelias from almost close to the ocean, up to the top of this Inselberg zone, in, in altitudes between 300 and 500 uh, meters above sea level. And we find different bromelians on the bottom and uh, on the top of the Inselbergs, and they, gotta need, they need to be protected. Uh, another city that is very important to talk is Itachim in Bahia, where there is the largest concentration of Inselbergs in Brazil, and we are still finding, uh, finding uh, new plant species there, new bromelian species there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Everton Hilo uh, and uh, the, the, the master uh, Marcio Lodegario found like a, a few weeks ago a new Chilenzia there, Chilenzia itachiensis. And we're going to work to make this species a kind of, of flag species to, for conservation because it's a new species, it's micro-endemic, and the uh, extractivist people are searching to put them on the international market. So we are advertising people to do not buy uh, plants that came from nature. It's very important to start to grow bromeliads, to start to grow chilenes in, in Brazil and all over the world, and have them as a sustainable activity to do not uh, promote the extinction, extinction of wild plants. So you can see how many, uh, the diversity of Inselbergs, how many different habitats we have. And uh, in this, in a place near, nearby the city, a, a few kilometers south from Intachins, we, we have a uh, Milagre city, where in 1990, 90, 1993, I discovered the Chilense Milagrensis with Luis Claudio Marigo and Eduardo Amado, my friend, biologist. And this is another place full of species, a big diversity of Chilenza in nature, not only Chilenza, but Alcantarea also. That's the place where uh, we discovered the Alcantarea species that named it after me, Alcantarea Naumi. And it's another place that there is no conservation unity. So we're gonna fight to have conservation units protecting the Inselbergs ecosystems in Bahia and Minas, uh, Espírito Santo and Rio de Janeiro states. 
So uh, since that, that time, in the beginning of the, the, of the 90s, I started to grow native species and propagate them to, to have a, a kind of, of, of uh, technology to, to help the ex situ conservation, but at the same time, introducing them in cultivation to have uh, important uh, genetic material from seeds and from a few pups, because we don't need to collect the whole genotype from nature. When you go to the nature, according to uh, each country and each uh, state laws of conservation, if you are always to, to collect seeds or collect plants, you don't need to take a, a genotype that uh, uh, natural selection took many decades to select of a plant that may be going to be very important to the species. And if you, if you can just collect, if you can just collect a few seeds and uh, even uh, uh, one or two pups, you're going to be able to introduce them as we did with many plants like the Alcantarena umich, Lenza milagrensis, uh, Neuragelia rubro vitata, and many others that are now very popular. So it's not difficult to start to introduce. We don't need to go to, through the extractivism to have them in the, in the Bromelian world. We need to understand that it's a slow process in the beginning, but uh, after some, a few years, there are so many good growers along the, the world, in Australia, in Europe, in the US, in Brazil, in other Latin countries, that we don't need to, to start fast with new introductions by strategies. We gotta, we gotta wait for the plants to be protected. In a few years, we're gonna be able, according to the Brazilian law, to have uh, plants under cultivation. So uh, here you can see a plant in, in a farm in high altitude in Minas Gerais state that we were sowing uh, since the 1996. And uh, this Friburgensi, Friburgensis, and this species on the right, that is a, a plant related to Vrija procera, maybe something new, they, they were so uh, successful that we even had the, the, the seed germinated in wires and fences. And after that, the, the whole garden is full of wild stuff. So it's a, it's a, uh, just takes a little bit of time, but after that, we were very happy. And uh, in nature, we can find beautiful epitypes of plants in Atlantic forest, like this white stricter and this Kesnelia, Kesneliana. And we are combining them to, to have uh, landscaping, tropical landscape in Rio. So we start to, to grow bromeliads in, in shade houses and greenhouses in Marica farm. Sowing them from seed and propagate, propagating them from pups and in 1992, we, we started uh, three plants in tissue culture in a, in a lab from Rio. We did the, the, the beautiful purple Neurogelia Royal Burgundy from, from the US and the other hybrid of Brazilian species, the Ikimea Ramosa by Fulgens. And uh, we did a, a Brazilian plant that it's called Ananas erectifolius also. And uh, this was, was the beginning, these, these plants were the beginning. And after that, we grew a lot of, of species and hybrids and start to hybridize them and uh, try to grow them in pots and in planters because we have a, a kind of, of sandy soil there, not a, a ocean sand, but a sand that came from the mountains, from waterfalls. But at the same time, we were uh, thinking about a kind of natural growing method. And uh, 
in since the, the beginning of the of the 90s up to uh, 2009 we did shade houses and greenhouses cultivation but after that uh, I found a, a piece of land a beautiful place in Kisaman State Kisaman County in Rio de Janeiro State and uh, I got a farm to grow pineapples and to grow wild bromeliads and uh, native cacti and other plants like the African aloe genus. And uh, we start to, to deal with that, with that. And we were very successful. The region is beautiful. We have a national park, the National Park of Jurubatiba, the biggest uh, Restinga area protected in Brazil nearby, just a few kilometers of us. And there we find many different uh, sandy uh, regions of, of sandy ecosystems of the true Restinga and the swamp areas of lagoons and, and uh, swamps. And uh, the, the place is called the Terraços Marinho Farm because it's an old area that's like a thousand years ago were the seafloor, so we have like a column of, of almost uh, 15 meters of, of ocean sand that now are raised like uh, six meters above sea level. But uh, we, we are, have been, uh, the sand have been washed by the rains uh, for many, many thousand years. So. Now the, the sand are, do not have, uh, do not have uh, salt and uh, the water is very good because the water came from the mountains of Dizingano, a very special place also where we have a state park of Dizingano, the home of the very rare Alcantarea Farnay. And uh, that, that, that uh, water came from the mountains, high altitude up to six, 1,600 meters above sea level, straight to our farm without crossing any uh, seas. So we have a, a great fresh water and a great soil. So in this resting ecosystem, most of the farm is uh, with, with uh, protected uh, Restinga ecosystems, we can find many typical bromeliads, like Bromelia chacanta, uh, as known with, with uh, cacti, like Cereus fernambucensis, Pilus Cereus arabidi, Peresca puleata, Melocactus violaceus. And we have a very special ecotype of Neuragelia cruenta there, something very different, different because it's not. Uh, a stoloniferous big plant as the typical Neuragelia cruenta. You can see here the, the clumps of this epotype, very thin and small and not stoloniferous. And this place is so different that, that we find lichens growing on the sand. And uh, we have some uh, different species like Bromelia chacanta the now endangered uh, Virgin agglutinosa, uh, a plant that is a species that is suffering a lot from the strativism to, to be used as an ornamental plant and also a uh, favorite from the cattle, the cows, they ate them. So in some places you cannot find them anymore and the problem were, was not that they were stolen. Uh, the problem is that the, the cattle are eating them. So we need to protect the areas and close that areas from the cattle. And another plant that is uh, very uh, easily to find in Hestinga vegetation are the variety Equalis of Icmea nudicaulis. And uh, this beautiful picture from Oscar Ribeiro from uh, Imperialis uh, Bromilid Company. Uh, show the, the rubra form of the Ikmeno de Cal is a plant that can reach a meter high. Very good one that we are starting to grow as a landscape plant. So we, we had a small part of the farm 
uh, from old grasslands where the people in 50 years, the last five decades, used to grow and breed cattle. A cattle uh, and uh, now we close them since uh, 2009 to make uh, agricultural areas and uh, we are doing sustainable agriculture with uh, without uh, using insecticides and fungicides and we are trying to reproduce the natural conditions because uh, giving water and fertilizer mainly organic fertilizer uh, we can we can have a great conditions to have uh, sun tolerant plants perfect ready to go to gardens so they, this our idea was a simulation of the native hissing vegetation where we easily find bromeliaceae cactaceae and myrtaceae the family of of the fruit the surinam cherry and uh, we, find, uh, we can find many species of all of these uh, plant families there. And we are working on, on a kind of model where we have uh, bromeliads, cacti, and that shrubs on the same places, helping one helping others because the long roots of cacti and, and the shrubs can uh, recover the, the water and the nutrients that bromeliads can't reach when they, they go into the soil. And we, we can say that we are very successful doing that. So here you can see our uh, combined uh, fields having native cacti like uh, melocactus oreas, Mexican species like the Echinocactus grusoni with jicas and, and orthophyton and incolirium. And uh, in, this, in this farm, we have three different kinds of irrigation systems. Uh, one of, of overhead splinters, of thin uh, drips. The best one that we, we found for bromeliad, tank bromeliads, you can see it in this picture, uh, where we are planting now dicas and orthophyton. And we have also the drip system, that is very good for pineapple and ananas cultivation. And we have a kind of, of overhead splinters of a bigger size with bigger drops that are not that good. The, the thin one is better, but uh, it's, it is working also to, to grow the more, more resistant species. So you can see the, the Ichmea, Portea, Neuragelia, and Tank bromeliads growing. Uh, on the sand, Alcantarea, Chu, and uh, they make big clumps and we are very uh, happy with, with, the, with the plants and we are expanding the area. And it's very good because the plants are ready to go to the, to the sun in the gardens, at the gardens. So two groups that we are working a lot to develop varieties and, and offer them to the market. Plants that are now starting to be treated by extractivism also, because uh, we, are, we are having uh, world famous for the Jika and Orthophyton genera now. They, they, are, uh, they are becoming popular because Kachi and, and succulents the succulent plants and shirophytes are becoming more popular all over the world. And uh, the people that grow shirophytes are discovering that are huge bromeliaceae as, as shirophytes, mainly Jicca and Orthophyton. And these plants are starting to be treated by extractivism, by that illegal people that are stealing plants from nature. So we have now Jicca stevesi, the species that is named after my friend, the big cacti, cactus schooler, Ed Stavis, a plant that is treated very expensive in the internet, Dica marniella postoli, and even dicas from the high diversity of dicas in the south of Brazil, from Pampa Bayon 
like this Chlorhistamina species. We have here what we call uh, Jaguarundi, a variety of that, the Chlorhistamina marrom. And the Orthophyton, here we have the Orthophyton glabrum, the white uh, form. And uh, we are very successful growing them. So you can see our fields of, of xerophytes that includes aloe from Africa, cacti, and uh, many bromeliads like this incolidium, the new species of incolidium in the center of the, of the image, gicchias, and uh, many orthophytons. So we establish them, let them make clumps, and after that we open the clumps and make planters. And you can see how happy they are growing there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start to talk about some bromelia uh, genera. And uh, we have a genera that now some schoolers are joining you know, on the same, one, same, same genus of Jicca, but we follow the ones that keep them separated as Jicca and Encolidium. Uh, Encolidium is, a, is an endemic Brazilian genus that we can find in uh, Minas Gerais, Bahia, uh, Mato Grosso, Goiás, many, many states. And we are working on a new species, the first Encolidium that will be described for Rio de Janeiro. It's a new species, not, we are not uh, growing them yet, and, but uh, we, it will be published in a few months. And uh, this plant came from Inselbergs on the north of Rio. And here you see, you can see the plant that I, I talked about, the, the Gica Marniella Apostoli, with other hybrids that we did. And uh, plants are beautiful and people from the landscaping market and the uh, Bromelia collectors in Brazil are starting to, to discover how beautiful Incolidium can be. So this big plant, a new species related to Encolidium spectabili. This plant is from Minas Gerais and other species from Minas Gerais, Encolidium adamantino, a beautiful small plant, silver one. They are very successful in, in open uh, gardens and in, in co open cultivation in Rio. So it's not a problem for us under our uh, understanding to have high altitude species uh, as long as you provide them uh, good, well-drained soils uh, and uh, the right fertilizer with low nitrogen and lots of, of skeletical uh, elements as uh, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and uh, the plants are doing great. There is not a problem. So we are, we are teaching people how to use them. And we are working on new varieties also. This Dica Purple Haze, in honor of the Jimi Hendrix music, a beautiful plant with, with a, a strong purple color and a beautiful orange flower and that make clumps. This is a must for landscaping. And we are starting to select uh, variegated plants like this pup that came out variegated and we name it uh, e this in honor to Dr. Johnny Scaldas da Silva, one of the first and the best bromelid collector, a great guy, a good friend of mine from Porto Alegre uh, that we can say that is one of the world authorities in Dica genus and uh, is one of the most important people for bromelids in Brazil. He's named, uh, more than 10 species of wild bromelids are named after him, and we are starting to honor him uh, for the new hybrids. And we're gonna honor the, him for the new Encolidium species from Rio de Janeiro, because we saw that plant in 1993 for the first time, and after 27 years, it still a new species. So the plants are growing. We are, we are uh, propagating more the, the easiest species, the, the fastest one, ones, 
like this hybrid of Dicleocina from Minas Gerais. And uh, we are starting to use them in landscape and teach people. So this, this garden were, were made, made on, on, the, on a stone with gravel, combining the wild Melocactus oreas from Bahia with the wild uh, Dicle Marniela apostoli, grew from seeds, the plant from, from Goiás state. And Dicas are, are very good because they are terrestrials, very sun tolerant. They use low water. If you have the right soil, it can even grow without irrigation, just with the natural rains. And they make big clumps. Uh, they are perennials. They don't die because uh, the incolinians, they are not perennials. They can make big clumps, but the, the rosette of, of leaves gonna be monocarpic and gonna die. And in Jika, we're gonna have a, a, the inflorescence came from the axillar buds on the, on, the size, on the side of the plant, and they're gonna keep growing forever. And that, that plants, that star shape uh, that we also find in agave genus, in aloe genus, and some other shadowfights like Echeveria, they are great to combine with, with con, columnar and uh, with a ball cactus, round cactus. So it's easy, it's almost ready to, to make the combination and big eye-catching landscape spots. So we are doing that and combining Brazilian species with uh, Mexican species and species from Bolivia, from Peru, from Chile, from the northeastern of Brazil. And I can say that that's the future of Bermuda landscaping, mainly because of the xeriscaping techniques that uh, promote uh, zero fights and uh, native species to, to do not uh, demand on, have, have high demands on, on the irrigation water. So another genus that is very important for me, mainly these species, Orthophyton glabrum from Minas Gerais, that I first collected seeds in 1993. Uh, it's, it's not found in, in Rio de Janeiro state, but we discovered that they are very, very suitable to resting vegetation and low altitude uh, conditions if you provide them uh, drainage and the right nutrition. So we have autophyton fields at the Hasso Varinhos farm. Uh, and then we are selecting many different stuff and hybrids to offer to the market. So these are one of our best crosses of the autophyton gurkeni, the banded one. I don't have a picture of, of it, but it, it's a, the most popular species of the genus, named after my late, very, very good friend, Luis, Claudio, Luis Carlos Gurki, uh, Dr. Fitum Gurkenai, um, crossed with, with the uh, silver Orthophyton leprosum, uh, made many different hybrids with different sizes and many different uh, co combination of colors and many uh, scales. So this Orthophyton Quachi on the right, is one of our best a miniature form. And this Orthophyton snow is a medium sized plant, very good for landscaping. And we also have this with a purple color on the bottom, but with many scales that make this different color of, of combination of silver and purple. This Orthophyton purple snow from the same cross. And we are doing small crosses small hybrids using the wild Orthophyton saxicola from Caatinga vegetation. And these are amazing because people love the small miniatures and they are very easily, easy, easy to grow. So we have this first selection called the Orthophyton head head that makes this, this red color of the inflorescence when in bloom.
But beautiful wild species are under propagation also, like this Orthophyton rubiginosum from Caatinga and Orthophyton lucidum, the species from Jequitinhonha Valley on the north of Minas and uh, near to the boundary of Bahia State, that is the center of diversity of Orthophyton genus, where we discovered new species. This Orthophyton lucidum, I was lucky to be when we discovered them and discovered it. And I was with uh, two very important guys for me from American guys, US citizens, uh, Harry Luther, the late Harry Luther, then uh, Dr. David Benzin, the best Bermudian, uh, biology of Bermudian schooler ever. And uh, I was with them and with the, the world famous Elton Levy in 1996 when we discovered this new species. And we also got a beautiful and unique species that Elton and, and Luther put the name of, of David Benzin on it, the Autophyton benzii that it's a huge, long plant, very different from, from all the other species on the genus. So we don't need to do much and we don't need to do many hybrids. Just cultivate the wild species of Orthophyton to have a great addition to the group of, of landscaping uh, bromeliads. But my favorite one is the wild Orthophyton glabrum that I already mentioned to, to, to collect it in 1993 with Eduardo Amado, my good friend. And this plant is strong red, very easy to grow, and do not uh, need any water during the cultivation. And we are selecting uh, different stuff, different uh, genotypes, different clones to make varieties. And this one on the, on the right, is uh, one with uh, yellow inflorescence. And we are also selecting uh, for the foliage color, having uh, yellow, orange, and strong red and purple color coming, some combination of purple and yellow, some good stuff gonna come on the, on the next year. And I, I, I start to, to, to make propaganda of these plants because we already have them to, to the market. And uh, we are introducing them to the Jike collector because they uh, look like Jike, but they are stoloniferous, easy to grow and uh, colorful. So in landscaping, it's very easy to combine them. They are terrestrial, very, very sun tolerant, needing just a little water from the rain they make big clumps and they have original shapes with strong colors. We are now uh, having a uh, beautiful jika, beautiful red and purple jika coming like the jika bullet marks, but jikas are not that common in the market until now and uh, we think that both are gonna be very popular in a few years all over the world and mainly in Brazilian landscaping market. So this is one of the, of the symbols of my company, the Botanica Pop, a company that joins a uh, uh, pop art approach, a psychedelic uh, aesthetics, uh, prehistoric aesthetics, uh, the ground floor aesthetics for the tropical landscaping. We are try to, trying to innovate in uh, doing un unusual uh, gardens. Uh, do not following the tradition of the English uh, landscaping that made the beautiful, impressive uh, gardens of Roberto Bullemarx, something that uh, is a kind of, of uh, a simulation resembling the nature mainly the nature of the open habitats. Uh, I didn't came up with the idea or to, to search in open ecosystems. That idea came from uh, Bullen Marx group 
people like Luiz Emílio and uh, Dimitri Sucre, great botanist from Rio de Janeiro, uh, my teacher Nanusa Menezes, and Bula Marx and uh, Jose Tabacou, uh, another friend of mine, great guy, a very uh, bright uh, uh, landscape architect, architect from, from Rio. And uh, they, they, they create the idea of the gardens that resemble the, the wild ecosystems. And I'm trying to do something different trying to make more uh, different uh, scenario with uh, the combination of, of zero fights and uh, strong colors. And it's very easy, very uh, fast to, to have the results. So another, another zero fight genus uh, of Bromeliaceae is Bromelia, something that we are starting to, to to grow now seen, uh, with major diversity. Uh, it's a native uh, genus of our Hesinga farm. This is a selection of uh, Bromelia antiacanta, the red clone, and very big. And we are using it to make hybrids with uh, Spinelance ananas and with Orthophyton and with Syncorea to make a huge, uh, colorful, landscape varieties but even so we know that uh, many uh, wild bromelia are uh, ready to, to utilize as a landscape variety uh, and we are we are doing a lot of this uh, bromelia yeronimi from the central south america from pantanal and paraguay and north argentina and it's a beautiful plant that it's very easy to grow. And we have here uh, the species at the Terraço Marinhos farm uh, with a uh, flowering one, the end of the, of the blooming, and uh, with fruits. So this plant uh, keeps almost six months of color with a combination of, of pink color of the inflorescence with the silver color of the leaves, sometimes resembling a chilensia, a terrestrial chilensia for landscaping. So I think that this is going to be very popular in the future also. And something that is very popular among Brazilian enthusiasts and uh, very, very easy to find in, in open habitats of, of Brazilian Restinga is Neuragelia. So we are selecting uh, mainly the Neuragelia cruenta species. Like this, we have at the picture the yellow cruenta, yellow and red cruenta selection. And on the left, we have the rubra, the red cruenta selection, uh, very bright plant that uh, we, we can find in our places. Rubra now. It's called the Neuragelia macaensis, a species that Elton did, and uh, is just found inside the Jurubatiba National Park. So if you find uh, plants that came from, from the wild, uh, they're gonna be from, from they, they, they're gonna come from the national park. So it's prohibited and we need to, to avoid it, to avoid buying uh, wild plants. We already have this plant under cultivation for many years. And we are doing uh, Neurogelia cruenta hybrids also. We got a selection of, of uh, cruenta with the, without scales on the top surface of the leaf. We call the uh, adaxial face in Latin, in botany. And uh, this original plant that looks alike, a lot like this plant on the right, on the left, I'm sorry. Uh, it's great to make hybrids. So we are doing that. I, I, I put the name of my wife on it, the Neurogelia Tachi, in honor of her. And uh, we are using them in landscaping. They are great because they are terrestrial and epiphytes. You can cho choose the, 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 the best way to, to plant them. 
the but neurogenia has a particular uh, characteristic that is you you have sun tolerant and shade uh, tolerant varieties in most of the cases in, in regular gardens they will not be able to be used in both environments so uh, in some places very close to the ocean or very high after a thousand meters above sea level you can have shade varieties growing taking some hours of full sun in the, in the summer months but uh, mainly we we need to choose the the best plant for sun or the right plants for the shade because uh, the most popular bromeliad in under cultivation in the whole world the Neuragelia caroninae the plant that uh, came from Brazil in the 18th century to to Europe to start to to, to have wild bromeliads under cultivation with Ecmea fasciata and with some Brigia species. Neurogenia caroninae is widespread in Atlantic forest, but it will not take full sun. Uh, at the same time, the Neurogenia cruenta will be big and thin in the shade, so we need to choose the right hybrids and species for each environment. But almost all of them are big clump formers, and uh, they used to have a color on the leaves, and the color will be almost always will be increased by by the blooms so we are selecting them selecting the best uh, cruenta hybrids and the uh, right plants to to match other uh, plants in landscaping like in this picture on the bottom left with uh, native and and uh, exotic foreign, foreign vari aeroid varieties uh, in a shopping mall in Rio. And uh, on the top, we have a hybrid between Cruenta and Carolina, selected for the red, bright color. And in the red, the picture shows uh, another ecotype of Neuragelia Cruenta, the ecotype from the west of Rio de Janeiro city. That is something. Uh, close to Neurogelia Johannes, Johannes from Angra dos Reis. So all of these plants are very good to hybridize. And in landscaping, we are matching the, the Neurogelias with uh, other xerophyte plants like agave, like uh, alo, aloe, and uh, like many different kinds of uh, crassulation uh, and asteraceae family like this Senesio on the right and uh, Echeverias and stuff. Uh, these, these are an easy combination of Nere, the colorful Neurogelia with uh, the Graptopetalum paraguayense, another crassulation from, from the south of Latin America. And you can see here the Bossa Nova a hybrid made by Roberto Menescal and Renato Bello, two very important bromeliad growers from Rio de Janeiro, very good friends. And uh, it's a hybrid between the Neuragelia compacta by Neuragelia camoriniana. And on the right, we have the Neuragelia fluminensis variegated, made a uh, uh, Stoloniferous uh, variegated uh, variety made by my best man, Chester Scott, the, the guy that is the best uh, bromeliad breeder in history. He made huge, many different stuff like this Neurogelia Chester on the bottom right, a shade tolerant plant, hybrid of Cacharodum and Carolinae. In this picture, we have on the top the Neurogelia Royal Burgundy that I consider some of the, one of the best hybrids ever made in Neurogelia. And in the left picture, we have Neurogelia Jalini, uh, Neurogelia Cruenta variegated that I discovered in nature, a pup, just a pup in a big clump in the Restiga. Uh, in 1992, I was studying the 
wild bromeliads from Marica, Restinga. So we found this and now it's a, a widespread all over the world and it's a, one of the best uh, landscaping variety, bromeliad variety. Another plant that it became very popular in the last two years, and Chester is doing great hybrids, variegated hybrids, banded, is the native Neurogelia carcarodum, uh, a rare species that lives on the top of the trees of Atlantic forest, mainly in the dry Atlantic forests uh, near to the coast of Rio de Janeiro in Espirito Santo. And uh, it's an old species, so we have many different ecotypes. This is uh, cross between the ecotype of Maricá County with the ecotype from Santa Maria Madalena, another great spot of bromeliad diversity in Rio de Janeiro. And we are selecting them. They are easy to grow as terrestrial plant and as a uh, epiphyte under cultivation. And we are, we are releasing good plants for, for, to combine under shade conditions and also under sun conditions in gardens. This plant on the right is very popular now. It's a Neuragelia pop, an exclusive hybrid of my company made when, you, when we pollinate the Neuragelia fireball with uh, pollen from Neuragelia cruenta rubra, now Neuragelia macaensis and uh, make big, huge, colorful clumps and are suitable for, for garden beds and pots and, and trees, uh, high altitude, near to the ocean, very versatile plant. And now we're gonna talk about Acmea and I consider in Acmea group also Portea genius and uh, Orenberg genius because these two other genius, uh, they cross with Echimea and they have almost the same size and patterns and are uh, great plants for the sun in landscaping. And uh, Echimeas and Porteas and Ohembergias, they are very good because they can be used as terrestrials and epiphytes. They uh, they take full sun, they make big clumps with strong colors and big size and many times big blooms also. So this plant, the Ekmea Ampla from Bahia, uh, is a, a plant that we have now a problem uh, like other uh, big bromeliads from Bahia because of destructivism for landscape use. So we are promoting the, the nursery growing of Ikmea ampla with uh, also with uh, Orembergia castellanosi, Orembergia litoralis, and Alcantarena umi. But Ikmea ampla, it's not that easy to go to grow because we have kind of, of fungus disease in Rio de Janeiro, humid climate. So we are selecting from seeds the best adapted plants and we are making hybrids also. Now we have the, this plant in landscaping, like in this picture in Buzius, uh, nearby Rio. Uh, and we, we already crossed that Ampla with this selection that is very popular in the United States because uh, Chester got this number nine clone of Ekmea Blanquitiana Rubra many years ago and uh, and now many people are, are growing them. And uh, this is a great plant for landscaping also because of the color of the leaves. And we know that as, as closer to the seashore, to the ocean, uh, if you use low nitrogen fertilizer and you give a lot of potassium and calcium and magnesium and other micronutrients, the plants develop a beautiful, huge uh, red to orange color. And we are using them, combined with other plants in landscaping. And we are uh, also making hybrids, as, I, as I, I told, 
This is the Ikmea David Blue, a hybrid of, of Ikmea Blanchettiana by Ikmea Ampla. In fact, the Ikmea Ampla is the mother plant. The Blanchettiana number nine gave the, the pollen. And I put the name of my dear late friend, Davi Azulay, a uh, great plant uh, collector also, a great guy with uh, wonderful ideas that helped a lot us to develop the Botanica pop concept. And uh, this plant is starting to be released to the market in Rio. But we also grow native stuff of porteas, like uh, this portea Petropolitana, a plant that we can find in Atlantic forest as epiphyte. Uh, and, and also as a uh, uh, rupestral lithophytic species in inselbergs, like in sugarloaf, and also used to be frequent, frequent not, not anymore, unfortunately, but used to be frequent in the Hishinga vegetation also. It's something that uh, is ready to the market with strong red foliage and this beautiful combination of purple and uh, uh, light red color of the inflorescence. And these portillas are great to cross with the big Ikmea, like uh, Ikmea blanchettiana and Ikmea aquiliga to make Portmea hybrids, like this plant on, on, the, on the right. So you can see some hybrids. This is another Ikmea move forward by Ikmea ampla on the right, on the left. On the right, we have uh, Ikmea kiliga by Ikmea shantina that made an easy plant for landscaping that we are, grow, we are growing. And we are keeping them in this Ikmea fields at the Hasmarinhos pond. Another group that I love, one of my favorite genus, uh, is Alcantaria. Alcantaria is a, a genus that we can find in Inselberg and a few species in, in uh, well, pastoral fields. And uh, in the picture, we have Alcantaria Roberto Kautsky that uh, Elton Lemmy named after our great friend, the late Roberto Kautsky from Spirit Santo, uh, maybe the most important uh, Brazilian bromeliad collector, a guy that uh, worked with not only with bromeliads and orchids, but with many different plants and animals. He already has over 90 species named after him. And I was very lucky to make, to, to make many trips with Kautskis to the fields of Spirit Santo, where we find a huge biodiversity of epiphytes along the mountains and insulbergs of Atlantic Forest. So, but Alcantaria are giant spineless bromeliads native from Brazilian Atlantic Forest, Opestral fields and Caatinga vegetation. Uh, and the big species of Alcantaria are monocarpic. They die after blooming, many times making uh, small uh, grass pups in the early stage but uh, they do not develop uh, the big pup from inside the rosette. Uh, the big species like Alcantaria imperialis and Alcantaria australiana, the one from, from the picture. So you can see a uh, uh, plant that already died, but uh, still with a beautiful shape, a beautiful uh, form for the, the landscaping. And, but it's going to die, so it needs to be replaced. And I was very lucky to have my friend, Dr. Leonardo Versier, uh, publishing his new book on, on the... In fact, it is the, his uh, doctorate degree with uh, Dr. Graça Vanderlei from Sao Paulo University, my teacher also. And they studied the, the Alcantaria genus and he published the Portuguese version and now he's releasing the English version, expanded. And I was very uh, honored to have, uh, to be a, a co-author in, in two chapters, uh, in one 
where we discovered two new species and another one with other guys, mainly John Bai from Australia, the best alcantaria grower in the world, uh, talking about uh, alcantaria cultivation. So this is a great book for people that love uh, landscaping bromeliads because it's, it's go over the most important uh, genius for landscaping with bromeliads. And you can see how high that uh, Alcantarea Robert Kautsky reach with a big stem over one meter high. It's higher than, than Leo. And uh, we now are, are releasing two new species. One of it, uh, the Alcantarea Intermedia, came from this Inselbergs on the north of Rio de Janeiro state a place that is not protected as a conservation unit. So we are working on it, proving how diversified the ecosystem is, how important it is to make a, some kind of conservation unit on it, because uh, you can see almost all the forests were destroyed to rise cattle farms. But at the same time, on the bottom of the Inselberg and on, mainly on the top, we have a uh, original forest, so we need to protect it from the cattle, from the fire, from the people that are going to cut it to make a new grassland. And uh, in this place, we find two uh, Alcantaria species, Alcantaria, the new Alcantaria Intermedia that we're going to see, and the Alcantaria Australiana. Uh, Brazilian species that were described by Dr. Leonardo Bessier from material from Australia. But it's very interesting because I, I first collected this in 1993 with my friend Johnny's and uh, the plant were in the market since the middle of the 90s and uh, people were classifying it as Alcantaria extensa, a much smaller species. And after people from Australia came and met uh, some Romanian people in Rio, they brought back to Australia seeds and, and uh, start to grow it. And it became popular because it's the biggest species in the genus. Now we are talking about this, this plant here, Alcantaria australiana, this one on the right. And uh, from Australia, uh, Dr. Leonardo Versier got it and described it as a uh, Alcantaria australiana, but it's a, a native species from Rio de Janeiro. So we are publishing two new species. One of it is this beautiful Alcantaria intermedia, a plant with many green leaves, very fast, and a plant that do not die. It pups making two or three or four, even five pups after bloom. And it has a beautiful, colorful inflorescence. And uh, inflorescence that attract many animals, like this Spenorhynchus uh, tree frog, that it's a popular tree frog in, in uh, uh, swamp ecosystems. The, this place is uh, our Marica farm, where we have many lakes and many, many tree frogs. And we are lucky to find them in the remitted uh, flowers. The other species that we are releasing in the book is Alcantarea delicata, also from the north of Rio de Janeiro state, also a plant that I start to, to grow from seeds in 1993, and uh, were just described 27 years later. I was honored to be one of the authors of the, of the species with uh, Leo Versier. So here we, we can see the plant in the wild, almost touching the destroyed vegetation, the place where the grasslands reach the Inselberg. Uh, it's an endemic species threatened by the fire mainly. You can see that this place already burned and we have this African uh, grass here on the bottom left, it's called the Panicum Maximum, and it's the most problematic inv uh, invasive species for our insubirds. But we are doing good 
growing them and using these species in cultivation, like in this farm in Minas Gerais, where we already have uh, Alcantaria Delicata under cultivation since 1997. Another very popular species wa was the, have been the Alcantaria Naumi, the plant that I collected with Luis Claudio Marigo in 1993, Luis Claudio Marigo and Eduardo Amado in Bahia, a treatment species that people are collecting to sell very cheap and very ugly with broken leaves uh, along the, the roads in Bahia to, to let to, to, to the landscaping market but easy to grow and very fast and beautiful bloomer uh, that we are growing for, for landscaping in Rio. So we are releasing new stuff. This is a, a must, Alcantaria Roberto Couch that I already showed. And uh, it's not easy to, to grow and propagate, never bloom. These plants are 27 years old with me and never bloomed but we are working to make grass pups on the stem and gonna self-seed all over the Alcantarellas. They are easy to self-pollinate, uh, to, to make a pure seed and uh, we're gonna grow it because it's fast and it tolerates lots of sun and dry climate. It's one of the best with another plant that I love that is Alcantarella serosa. I'm gonna show you. The two, my, my two favorite species with Alcantaria Naumi, with beautiful flower, are Alcantaria Serosa and Alcantaria Roberto Cautico. So uh, we are selecting stuff, making hybrids of Alcantaria also. This uh, albuminated one is a pure uh, Alcantaria glaziwana, the species that is. Uh, native from Rio de Janeiro and Niterói cities, uh, growing in Inselberg, uh, close to the ocean. And I was very lucky because I collected seeds uh, in Maricá in 1992. And in 1995, we discovered this uh, albuminated perfectly, albuminated seedling that we grew up, and now we are propagating. And I put the name of my grandmother, Emilia, on it. So it has a perfect white variegation and it's easy to grow very fast, beautiful plant. So we are doing hybrids. And uh, one, of the, one of it is uh, Alcantaria Naumi on the, on the left. And uh, another one, uh, is on the right is a plant, plant that we are naming a hybrid of Alcantaria Naumi by Alcantaria Delicata that you can see here with uh, Dr. Leonardo Versier that we, we're going to name uh, Frenchy in honor to the uh, pioneer of Bromeliad collection uh, in California. I promised my friend Barry Landau, the guy that uh, made possible for us to have this presentation, to honor his teacher of, of bromelia uh, growing. And uh, I see that these Alcantaria French are gonna be maybe the, the highest bromelia hybrid ever done. And it's a beautiful plant and it's nice because it's big, but it's making pups and it's blooming for the first time in Kisamon Farm. Here we have other uh, Alcantaria Delicata hybrids, a beautiful stuff crossed by Naomi, by uh, Geniculata, by many others. We have selections of, of Alcantaria Naomi also. It's a huge plant and we are selecting the plants with small compact rosettes with uh, the most colorful inflorescence. And we are doing by generic hybrids also, like this Vricantarea, Jenny Jasmine. Dr. Jenny Jasmine is very important in my life. Uh, she's a, a researcher of ornamental plants and agronomy. 
in the North uh, Eastern uh, University of Rio de Janeiro, WENF, one of our sponsors. And uh, we, we honored her with this hybrid because it's one of the prettiest hybrids that we already made. And it's a very curious plant because it's a hybrid of, of the very small Virgia Rodigaziana uh, from Parati region. A small plant, an amplified, that we put pollen of Alcantara imperialis on it. So made this beautiful, big, bigeneric plant that uh, resemble the Alcantara naumii, but it do not have, does not have uh, any naumia on it. It's just imperialis by Rodigaziana. So I was talking about Alcantara serosa in in, uh, in landscaping. Alcantaras are great because they are. Uh, terrestrial, full sun, take almost full sun in growing stones and even in concrete. And uh, they, they can be big clump formers like Alcantarea intermedia, Alcantarea glaziuana, Alcantarea laumia, or monocarpic, like the biggest ones, as I already mentioned, the, the Alcantarea imperialis and Alcantarea australiana. And in landscaping, Alcantarea has strong colors including white and silver colors from scales and locks, like uh, this uh, Alcantarea serosa, that is my favorite, uh, that became white in landscaping. And we are using, combined with other bromidids, other plants like these aerates, uh, and people love them. So now we are trying to diversify it and not just use Alcantara imperialis in landscaping, and Serosa is our uh, first choice because we already grew them a lot from seed. We started to grow them in 1993. Uh, in this time, I was studying Alcantara in the field, in the wild, because I was thinking in do my master degree in the Washington University, nearby Missouri Botanical Gardens, but at the same time, I got a problem to get my, uh, my graduate uh, certificate from Rio de Janeiro uh, State Uni uh, Federal University. The, my certificate just came in 1998 because of the, my first uh, period in Sao Paulo University. So I didn't uh, went to the US to do my, my master's degree, but I studied the, the Alcantarians a lot. And this plant went to the market in 1997, uh, much, early, uh, much earlier than, than the plant were described by three great friends of mine. Uh, they already mentioned the, the, the biggest Brazilian uh, Romanian taxonomist, Elton Leme, with uh, André Paviotti and uh, Otávio Ribeiro. Otávio is a great uh, Brazilian grower not only only bromidid, but uh, native species grower in in uh, Espinhaço Mountains, uh, north of Serra do Cipó National Park, and uh, Otavio is is developing new introductions and new Jica. He's a, a good, very good taxonomist of Jica genus, and he is doing his master degree on it. So these species were described by these three friends of mine. And we are also, of course, doing landscaping with uh, Alcantara imperialis and other species like this Alcantara vinicolor, a beautiful plant, but it's not that easy to keep the, the color in low altitude. Alcantara imperialis, it's easier. We have uh, uh, plants, red plants that keep the color on, on near to the, to the sea level, but not vinicolor, vinicolor. But Alcantara imperialis is a must, and it's very good for landscaping. We, and we are very happy because in Brazil now, we have over 100 growers doing Alcantara imperialis from seeds. So we proved that it was possible to do not 
uh, steal plants from nature, from wild population, and after introducing it, because the first guy that used it, uh, who used this species, was Bruno Marx in early 50s of the 20th century. And now we have a big uh, established market of Opantaria imperialis with uh, plants that came from horticulture, from many, almost all Brazilian states now uh, have growers growing imperialis and we are very happy because of that. Imperialis is a, an easy plant, easy to combine with many others. Beautiful when bloom, giant uh, colorful inflorescence. And now uh, we're gonna start to talk about my favorite genus, Ananas, the pineapple genus. Uh, a group of bromeliads that are the most popular ones because of the pineapple, the third tropical fruit in the world market and uh, a group that we have uh, a very important human uh, history because we have uh, three wild plants in the genus uh, uh, ananas, ananasoides the the white the the widespread species from uh, the north of amazon state up to Paraguay, uh, the thin leaf, spiny uh, species that grows in, in Cerrado and in Pantanal. We have the wild uh, Ananas parguazensis from Venezuela, north of Brazilian Amazon in Venezuela, uh, a beautiful species also. And we have the Ananas fritzmilleri, a plant, a rare plant from the coast of the of the states of Sao Paulo and Paraná, uh, plant with lots of bracts in the inflorescence that resembles the well-known Ananas bracteatus, uh, a semi-domesticated, I was telling that there are three species, three wild species, and some semi-domesticated like Ananas bracteatus and Ananas nanus. Uh, some people uh, are, are calling all of the species varieties of, of uh, uh, Ananas famosus, but I don't agree, and I'm still following the beats and downs in the sense that I, I separate the species because, mainly because uh, gene flow is not approved that all the species become to a single one. Because if, if it was that, most of the Neurogelia vrija and the uh, Chilenzia that are very diversified genus, uh, genera, in Bromeliae's family, they were belong to just a few species because it's uh, all of the species, they exchange gene, genes in, in, if you pollinate them, ex situ in cultivation. And uh, I believe that most of the diversity of species in this uh, genera came from a process that uh, just recently were described by Arnold uh, called the uh, hybrid speciation. That it's a process that uh, where species appear in, in nature from a hybrid process uh, originating a new species from hybridization. It's, it's something completely different of the hybridization that we do in the cultivation, but it's a similar process. And in Ananas, I, I believe that the early, early Indians from South America, they promote that kind of hybridization between wild and cultivation species. And two of the species, uh, the spineless uh, Ananas comosus, because many varieties of Ananas comosus, the pineapple, are spineless and the spineless ananas erectifolius we can consider already domesticated because they show up uh, traits that we cannot find in the wild species. So in this in this frame we can see the ananas monstrous 
a crownless uh, plant close to the pseudonanus sagenario species, a related genus to ananas. Uh, ananas monsters came from uh, Amazon and we are using it in process with ananas comosus. And then we have two pictures of hybrids coming from seed in greenhouses. In greenhouses, we are growing plants from seed and from tissue culture. And we have some hybrid fields at the farm where we have many different hybrids that we have been doing. And uh, ananas breeding are the, the most interesting uh, activity inside the family, the bromelias family, because we can make plants for fruit market, for potted plants market, for landscaping market, for tropical cuttings, uh, considering inflorescence, cut inflorescence and cut foliage, and even for fiber because people don't know, but uh, pineapple and ananas, uh, they make one of the best fibers, natural fibers in nature. Long, very resistant fibers that uh, Brazilian uh, Indians used to, to use to make clothes and, and to, to fish the pineapple fibers. So we are developing many hybrids using almost all the species and uh, selecting the colorful ones, the, the best plants for, for potted plants and for uh, long inflorescence. And we already reached the, the, the 12th uh, generation since 1992. We did the first crosses in 1994 of uh, Ananas erectifolius by Ananas bracteatus. And after using uh, the diversity of the genus, we got many different colors and uh, bract colors. And uh, we many, have many different combinations of uh, the color of the crown, the color of the bracts, the color of the eyes, the color of the, of the leaves. Many times the plant has more than five colors on, the, on, the, on a single clone. And the spineless variety is gonna reach the market in the next years. We already are already releasing some. And some miniature ananas. We have many miniature colorful spineless varieties. They're gonna be a must for the potted plant market because they are easy to grow. They do not hold water between the leaves that some people uh, erroneously uh, think that is a problem because of the mosquito. We know now that uh, tank bromeliads like Neuragelia ichmea and Vrigia do not uh, hold uh, mosquito larvae or eggs. But anyway, uh, plants like the spineless small banana is gonna be good for, for this kind of, of market niche. And we are doing new crosses and, and finding beautiful plants. Some are huge for landscape market also uh, because of the color of the foliage. And uh, all the ananas, they pups after bloom. So it's easy to propagate, it's, it's easy to make clumps to make big clumps for, for perennial color in landscaping. And we are working also with mutations because uh, some, some clonal mutation like variegation and uh, crested uh, pineapples are huge for, for the market also. So in the right, we have the variegated form of one of our red pineapples. Uh, we have of the fruit with the presence of both pigments of chlorophyll and anthocyanin, the pigment that make the red and purple and black color in bromeliads. But on the, on the left, we just have the, the anthocyanin. We don't have the chlorophyll, so the, the fruit reach the pink color. 
and it's very beautiful to have it uh, in cultivation. Even thinking that the whole plant, the whole fruit, gonna change to to strong pink and strong red color when ripe. And we are doing also some crested pineapple that are very interesting. Some of these also have have uh, edible fruits like this plant on the on the left. But variegation is the best uh, trait for the new uh, ornamental varieties. So we have it in the landscape plants and potted blooming potted plants like this on the on the left. And we also have it in, in big plants for landscaping with edible fruits like this on the right with this spot of the presence of the chlorophyll also like the other one. This is different to this. This black spot has both pigments also. This is a, a, a plant that is ready to be released. I named it the uh, Ananas Elton in honor of Elton Lemmy, my master, a guy that put my name on two plants, two wild species, because I have also the Cornelia Naomi from Roraima Mountains, a plant that I collected with my brother Felipe and uh, Luis Claudio Marigo in 1994. And Elton named after me, I was very honored because Cornelia is a genus that uh, you cannot almost, uh, you cannot find in, almost cannot find in cultivation. Came from 3,000 uh, meters above sea level in, in the tepuis of Venezuela. And uh, na Elton named it after me. And I was promising to, to make a, a beautiful hybrid, hybrid named after him. So this is a, a hybrid of the regular Ananas comosus, pineapple, variegated one with these beautiful bracts uh, and a beautiful color. And the plant on the, on the right is the same one with almost ripe fruit, but uh, the stable variegation we found on the plant on the, on the left. <coughs> so you can see the same plant when we selected the stable variegation this pup on the bottom of the fruit uh, were selected to make this plant on the left. And uh, it shows up how uh, slow is the process. So that's something that Chester is the, the best guy in the world to do it. He doing that with Neurogelia, sometimes you, you get an almost white plant, but le forcing it to pup you can uh, get the perfect variegation. Uh, talking about the bidum, uh, pick the variegation or the albumagination. And uh, in this picture, we can see on the back uh, a mixed variegation, three white pups, and the perfect one that we took to name Elton after it. So, Pineapple, uh, ananas are, are, are originating uh, beautiful uh, landscaping varieties, spineless one with lots of flower or color in the flower or in the foliage. And we are working hard since uh, the middle of the 90s uh, with the red pineapple genie pool uh, to, to get uh, red pineapples for the fruit market, plants with uh, unique tastes and smells, and the uh, anthocyanin pigment. It's very important because it's a nutraceutical pigment that science is discovering to help a lot uh, the human health because of the uh, the the potential of the of the uh, substance, the anthocyanin, the molecule, to help in, in uh, as an antioxidant and in other other uh, diseases like uh, uh, 
uh, heart diseases and the pressure diseases. And the uh, bromeliads also uh, have pineapple, including the bromelin enzyme, that it's a very important uh, digestive enzyme, very good for, for our health. And we have a third uh, substance, third molecular that, that are very good inside pineapple, that gonna keep pineapple as a superfood for the future, that is uh, melatonin, the sleeping hormone. People don't know, but uh, many fruits have uh, melatonin inside, including apples and oranges, and mainly pineapple. So it's very good to eat these fruits before you go to the bed because it help, help the digestion and help the, the, to, to sleep well. So this uh, red pineapple gene bank are under develop and uh, we have many black and unique hybrids coming and we already uh, developed uh, an original exclusive trademark called Puan that is a native uh, word from the Tupi Guarani Indians from Brazil that means uh, round and we use uh, this uh, word to, to create our trademark for red pineapples uh, with this uh, draw of the cut pineapple that resembles the sun and uh, uh, we have it as a as a, a trademark for the red pineapple of Rio de Janeiro, because people don't know, but the pineapple really came. the The pineapple were domesticated, was domesticated by many Indian people at the same time, thousand years ago, and we uh, have the ananas bracciatus in Rio de Janeiro. And we used to have wild pineapples there also before the great uh, destruction of the Atlantic forest. So we have in this Kisaman County where we have the Terraço Marinhos farm, we have uh, one of the best terroir, the best condition of soil and climates in the world for pineapples, where we uh, can grow them without using fungicides and insecticides with a great uh, sugar content, low acidity, low acidity, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna promote them a lot for the world market in the next years. This is one of of the varieties of red pineapple that we are doing. You can see the flash. Uh, we are searching for the red flash, but now we just have strong yellow and uh, strong orange flash colors, uh, but uh, they are very juicy and we have a unique aroma that came from the edible skin, edible red skin, and uh, we are working to develop new recipes of sweets and uh, new uh, dishes of, of, of food, combining them with chicken and fish and salads because if you cut the old brack, the old bright, dried brack, brack, the skin are perfectly ed edible and has a taste, tasteful uh, flavor. But we are working also with the regular pineapples, uh, not known uh, colorful ones, and selecting for the best taste uh, including MD2 hybrids. MD2 is the most popular variety in the world right now. It was developed, developed in the 70s in Hawaii by Del Monte and Dole companies. And now we are in the fifth generation of MD2 hybrids. So we have very different stuff coming plants that are beautiful because we know that pineapple is called the king of fruits uh, because of the crown, but also because of its unique shape 
It's a unique position in, in the tropical world. And uh, we think that we're gonna go deeper with that, doing very uh, original pineapple fruits for the market and delicious also. And we are also working, uh, growing uh, to the market and using in the, our breeding programs, the new Brazilian, newest Brazilian uh, disease resistant varieties like this, the IAC Fantástico developed by the, the, the very traditional uh, Agronomic Institute, Institute of Campinas from Sao Paulo State. This plant is one of my favorite pineapples in the world because it has a very sweet taste and a beautiful orange flesh. And we are growing it and it's very good because this is natural uh, resistant to, to the fungus disease that is a major problem in pineapple uh, uh, agriculture. But we are also working with this Vitoria variety developed by Embrapa and Incaper from Spirit Santo stage, another uh, natural resistant variety with a white flesh and a beautiful yellow uh, fruit, very uh, strong and a plant that we are uh, advertising also as a beautiful uh, landscaping plant because the short uh, escape make the fruit come from the middle of the leaves. It's very compact, very easy to grow. I, I, I think that it's maybe the best, the easiest pineapple variety for uh, non-specialized people, regular growers, regular garden owners and landscapers. And it's gonna become more popular in the, in the next years. In talking about ornamental bananas, we are growing them in tissue culture and uh, we already have a huge uh, amounts of, of plants. We are starting to, to sell them, to export to overseas. I hope to, to see our varieties in California in the near future. They are very easy to grow. They take full sun. They just need to, to have a well-drained soil and fertilizer, fertilizers are very important for, for the cultivated ananas varieties, talking about pineapples and uh, ornamental ones, because they have been selected by, by the Indians and by the growers all over the world for the fast grow, for their fast grow and the uh, high yields of production. So they need to be fertilizer more than any other bromeliads. They gonna grow faster, they gonna pop, they gonna make beautiful inflorescence and fruits. And uh, this, is our, this is our main variety, a hybrid of three species that I did in five generation. And it's a very vers versatile plant that I named after my late uh, Lebanese grand, grandfather, Camilo. Uh, and this variety is, is very beautiful, very good for landscaping use, for, but it can also be uh, grilled as a small potted blooming plant variety. And uh, you can take even fibers from the leaves because they are strong because it has 12.5% of ananas erectifolius on it. And even the fruit is edible because it has some ananas comosis on it. So some of our customers uh, call us to say that the fruit is good, a little bit fiber, but uh, you can do sweets and you can do juices on it. And I think that this will become a, a world uh, famous, very popular variety in the next years because it's easy and it's very versatile. We are growing it also for to cut flowers in fluorescence and uh, to cut leaves for the export market. So here you can see our 
pineapple plantation in Terraços Marinho. In these places of Terraços Marinhos, we have uh, the ornamental plant besides the, the fruit varieties. We grow them in uh, planters, in beds covered by, by plastic. But now we are changing to use uh, biodegradable uh, organic uh, plastic from uh, an European company called Polysac. It will be much better because we will not have waste because we can use it in organic farm, the plastic, but we need to remove the plastic as fast as possible after harvest. And this organic uh, plastic will not be necessary to remove. It's going to uh, be, become a black earth. So you can see our uh, Camilo plantations, the, the size that plant can reach if you fertilize them a, a lot. And uh, we have the, the, the plantation with uh, blooming plants on the right. So we have both ornamental fields and uh, fruit fields of red pineapples. And here you can see one of our varieties and how uh, red the fruit can reach after ripe. And uh, these two are of the same variety that I first showed as a variegated fruit. So you can see how red it turns. This is the same plant, the same clone, same genotype. But this is a variegated fruit, unripe, a green fruit. And this is the fruit when we, we reach the, the edible stage, this red one. So we are growing it in big amounts to the uh, world market for, for fruit consumption. But at the same time, it, it is a beautiful plant uh, for landscaping use. And we have this uh, idea to have bananas in many different markets. Uh, this is another variety of our red pineapples with our trademark Puan. And we are very happy because our region of Kinsam Kinsaman County is an old sugarcane region where the, the Portuguese people used to grow sugarcane like uh, 250 years ago. And uh, we have a big tradition of fruits and uh, sugarcane uh, sweets and beverages. So pineapple, the red pineapples are coming to fit and make even better uh, beverages with cachaça and native plants and uh, make huge sweets with banana and guava. And we are gonna be able to have a whole new industry coming. So we are offering genetics, technology and branding for new projects. And now we are on the uh, 12th uh, generation variety. It's an old uh, image like uh, six years ago. And uh, my company works with that, works with agriculture, horticulture, landscaping, and uh, restoration also. We are very happy to help people in restoration projects, supplying uh, bromeliad, native bromeliads, native cacti, native species with the right genetics uh, according to, to uh, conservation genetic protocols and uh, helping restore some of the wild ecosystem that uh, were lost. And uh, I would like to uh, say thank you to our partners and sponsors on innovation, the state uh, Innovation Agency of Rio de Janeiro, FAPERG, the Federal Innovation Agency of Brazil, FINEP, uh, the Jardim Botânico of Rio de Janeiro, Rio Botanical Gardens, an old partner of us, the WEF, uh, University of, of North Rio de Janeiro, 
the State University of North Rio de Janeiro, and the Ministry of Agriculture of Brazil. All of them are supporting us in our activities related to uh, plant breeding, horticulture, and agriculture. Uh, now I would like to, to show you how you can uh, order the book of Dr. Leonardo Versier by this link here. The link is going to be available in the chat. And I would like to say thank you all. Thank you all the people from the board of La Balona uh, Valley Bromidian Society. Uh, Barry Landau, very good friend of mine. Uh, for the opportunity to talk about Brazilian Brumidians in this meeting. Thank you, people. So now I'm gonna take a look on the on the chat to see if there are uh, questions. Pedro, I was looking through most of the uh, chats as you were talking. I didn't see very many questions. There were a lot of really nice comments and uh, uh, words of appreciation and stuff, but I didn't see too many questions. Okay. So I'll, you, I'll, I'll, you I'll, what, what I'll do questions. is I'll, I'll unmute everybody so that uh, you can feel some uh, verbal questions. Okay. Let me see. Okay, you gotta figure out how to do that. I'm sorry. Okay, you can you can unmute yourself if you want to ask any questions. Pedro, thank you so much. It was thrilling to watch and see the pictures and hear all your information. We're so appreciative of what you've done for us. That's my plan. Pedro, it's Barry. I just want to thank you very much. And uh you know, I, we're going to invite you back. I'm sure there's at least another talk on Neurogelias and on Talansia. So we're going to have you uh, several times in the future to uh, talk to all of our members again. That's good. If you want to, if you want to meet you to answer some of the questions that I can see, some of them came privately to me. Sure. Uh, one of these came uh, from Paul Wingert. Uh, and it's talking about uh, the soil, the organic matter used to grow autophyton. Asking if they grow in pure sand. It's a very good question because uh, in our farm, we have a, a column of, of 15 meters, uh, almost 45 feet of pure sand, pure ocean sand, but in some spots, we have lots of organic matter from the old ecosystems before uh, the grasslands were established. So uh, we discovered that some plants like the tank, bromeliads like Ikmea, Neurogelia, and Alcantarea, they prefer to have uh, at least 20% uh, of organic matter mixed with the sand. But if you give fertilizer and water, you can grow the zero fight bromeliads like uh, Dicke, Orthophytums, Bromelia, and Ananas without any organic matter. If you give organic matter like uh, composted manure or uh, other like uh, uh, chicken waste, uh, you, you, the plant's gonna like, but you can grow them on the sand without using any organic matter on the, on the soil, just giving the right nutrients. And we are talking about right nutrients, talking about uh, uh, at, at, at least the right proportion between nitrogen and, and uh, potassium. We never give more than uh, the same amount of nitrogen and potassium in the beginning where you need to, when you need to give uh, phosphorus also to let them plant roots. But after the plants start to grow, we give twice the amount of, of 
of uh, potassium related to nitrogen. That's very important for the plant to be strong and to a uh, good plant to grow in a full sun with magnesium also and uh, to do not have the tender leaves and the smell that attracts insects that nitrogens promote. Pedro, um, th there is a question from uh, Jean and she, uh, I'll read it. We have seen news coverage of rainforest being burned under Brazilian president uh, Osama policies. What obstacles have you encountered in trying to protect bromeliads and other species and how did you overcome them? It's not easy because Amazon is giant and we have a, a problem of the climate change all over the world. You see that you are having problems with fire in California in the last years, in Portugal also. And uh, the, 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 the climate stability in the whole world is uh, under threat. So now in Rio, we are having the strongest cold wave in 35 years. So the, the, with the climate change, uh, the, the fire came much strongest in places like uh, Cerrado and Pantanal and Amazon. And uh, the, the main problem is that the, the uh, illegal farmers and the wood uh, businessmen, illegal wood businessmen and illegal cattle uh, farmers, they are uh, setting fire to the Amazon to destroy it and change the, the ecosystem to establish grasslands. So it's a problem all over Brazil, all over uh, other uh, Amazon countries in Latin America. And it's very hard for us to, to fight and to rescue uh, treatment uh, bromeliad species. And it's crazy because even close to big cities, we are finding, we are discovering uh, new species of plant and animals and uh, if, you, if you think that some new primates, like monkeys, new species of monkeys have been discovered in the last years in Amazon, you can imagine what about uh, native plants and uh, plants that just grow uh, on the top of the trees. And uh, I, I mean, they are very vulnerable. Uh, uh, Amazon uh, is, is, not, is a very rich biome of, of uh, biological diversity, but uh, curiously, uh, it's not the, the richest, richest because uh, Atlantic forest, even thinking that almost uh, 80, 85% of the Atlantic forest were destroyed in the first centuries of Brazilian history, we still have more Bromeliad species in Atlantic forest and even in Cerrado vegetation, in Pampa vegetation from the south, and even in, in northeastern Caatinga. So it's not a big, big problem for the Brazil, Brazilian bromeliad flora, the, the, the destruction of Amazon, but it's a real oh, major God. problem of the world. Oh, dude. So we got we got to keep uh, studying and, and uh, searching for new stuff that is coming, not only in Bromeliaceae family, but also in orchid family and aeroids, and even in cats from Amazon. Uh, is there an, another question? Yeah, there was, there is one. Um, let's see, uh, the question is, do you have Varicia Pandelophora, you showed a fo photo of mass cultivation. Is it not in Australia and New Zealand? It should grow well. Um, what region? I didn't understand species. Pandulifora. Pandulifora. Yes. I, I can't remember this species. Isn't so that very tropical? 
Doesn't is it very pendulous with pink and fluorescence? Oh, it was uh, the looks like the the Scalaris bridge, a small one from inside the forest. Oh no, penduliflora! I show I show I, I I know the picture. Yeah, no, penduliflora is a is a high altitude species, uh, close to Brigia septum, from the high altitudinal fields of Rio de Janeiro and the Minas Gerais state. Uh, I'm searching for the for the picture. And uh, it's a beautiful plant, but we are growing them from seed, try to select the, the, the best penduliflora genotypes for, for cultivation. We are doing hybrids also with Alcantarén, with small vrija. But it's a treatment species because it's not uh, that common. It's a rare species, but it's a huge plant. And uh, we can find beautiful ones like this uh, from uh, Ibitipoca State Park of Minas Gerais, where we find a beautiful. This is the plant, right? Can you see that? Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. The, in this place in, in Ibitipoca Park, uh, Penduliflora grows on on the rocks on the on the soil of uh, high altitude small forest. But we can find in lower altitudes, around 1,000 meters, 800 meters above sea level, we can find penduliflora in, on the top of the trees also, mainly near to the rivers. And uh, it's a beautiful plant, medium-sized, and uh, very close to Vriza septrum, as I told. But Vriza septrum has a more reddish inflorescence. Very Thank good you. to hybrids. Pedro, this would be a this would be a shade plant or an indoor plant, indoor pot culture plant. Right? That, that's a good question, Barry, because uh, the point is that uh, this group of regions they do not grow in the shade, in the wild, in the wild. They are sun tolerant plants that grow in the sun, but the point is that they came from a high altitude, yeah. so they need the high altitude to grow in the sun. And they yeah. will not tolerate shade uh, in, in under cultivation, but at the same time they will not tolerate the, the direct sun. So we yeah. are doing hybrids with that, and we are selecting the best pure species for for cultivation. But it's not an easy species. So the high the high altitudes it helps them keep a lower leaf temperature. I see yeah. what you're saying. They can tolerate sun because of the lower leaf temperature at high altitudes. Yeah, it's ma mainly for Brigia group and some Chilenses. The high altitude is a problem for us in cultivation yeah. because yes. they are not easy to, to, to establish in low altitudes. But, uh, I have one other question. Other group, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For other groups like Dikia, uh, come from, from high altitude, do not used to be a problem. We can grow them. As long as you give full sun and drainage and hard fertilizer, they're going to grow. Dick and Orthophyton going to grow easily in, in lower altitudes. Let me ask you one question. Do you folks have any Weraria? Or is that mostly up in Colombia and up the higher montane? And no, Chester, Chester gave me the Weraria sanguinolenta many years ago. It's a beautiful plant, uh, purple leaf. Uh, but uh, they will not take any direct sun in Rio. So yeah. I'm not, uh, we, we, we also have the, the old Vrigia Cooperiana, the Veraria Cooperiana, the spotted one from Costa Rica that I got from Chester also. This is a beautiful plant. I love it. And uh, it's not easy to grow in a full sun, but it's, at least it's an easy species when you have shade cloth in Rio. But uh, to be honest, I will not uh, pay much attention to foreign species because we have so much uh, new stuff coming. Yeah. And uh, uh, wild diversity that we, we got to be fast to have these plants uh, coming from commercial production before uh, the impact of strativism arises in wild populations. Well, I think, I think you're Nancy brilliant. Grove. Nancy Groves, do you have a question? You had your hand up. 
Oh, I just had a question about uh, what kinds of fertilizer. Uh, for, for which group, Nancy? Anonymous, I'm sorry. For anonymous, what kind of fertilizer? Oh, we, we, we discovered that uh, the nitrogen is very popular because it promotes the fast growth and uh, fast leaf elongation. But nitrogen for cultivated plants, not only for bromeliads, they, they are problematic in the sense that they make the that's what what's that is something that i learned with my friend uh franz gruber the nitrogen promotes the the uh tenderness of the of the epidermis of the leaves and uh, it's easy for the fungus to penetrate and it's easy for the insects to to eat the leaves so we use low nitrogen fertilizers with high uh, potassium uh, contents and high magnesium, high calcium. We use a lot the uh, calcium nitrate to foliar feed the plants. And we are using lots of organic uh, solutions like the uh, bone powder solution and the lime solution. And we are also using a little bit of amino acids uh, made from uh, algae and from fish industry to feed the plants. And uh, we are thinking that the fertilizers are the most important thing when you talk about commercial production of pineapples and commercial production of ornamental bromeliads. Because uh, with, with the right fertilizers, you can, you can get fast, very well grown plants and uh, we can we can make them uh, beautiful uh, leaf colors with without uh, having problems of many uh, diseases and, and, and insects and uh, talking about uh, neurogelia we discovered that giving lots of organic fertilizers like even uh, organic matter matter made with worms and uh, Warm uh, uh, cow manure and mm -hmm. other stuff at the beginning will be good for the plant to start fast growing. And after that, no, no nitrogen at all. We just give the other uh, uh, elements, the other fertilizers to, to have a, a perfectly uh, colorful neurogelias coming. Okay. okay. There's a couple of other questions. Uh, do you use crushed oyster shells? Never, never tried it. Okay. I, I, I think that uh, it's very good to use dolomite, like uh, we have in Brazil, uh, a kind of lime. We have two different kinds of lime. One that is uh, calcium, uh, what's the name in English? It's uh, one, of, of the, of one of the lime came from the calcium that is um, uh, the people get the, the mines in, in the, at the mountains. Nitrate. This is not the best one, what? Nitrate, calcium nitrate? No, calcium nitrates is when you give ni nitrogen with calcium. I'm talking about lime. Lime is used to make the soil, the, uh, to uh, rise the pH of the soil before you, you do the agriculture. And we have two different kinds of lime. I'm talking about it because the lime that came from uh, ocean uh, uh, dolomite is the best one. And it has a little bit of magnesium on it. So it's the only way that I give some kind of seashells for my plants, but it's not the oyster powder, as people ask. Okay, here's another question. Have any um, pineapple fruits been introduced to the U.S. yet? Oh, we are working on it, but we have many customers around the world, and we are uh, slowly uh, 
expanding the production, but I think that next year we're gonna send some, some fruits to the Melissa company of my friend Bill in California. And you're gonna be able to, to taste it. And whenever you come to Rio, you're gonna be able to taste it also. Okay, another question is, uh, Orphophytum Oretum safe from extinction? Orthophytum what? Oretum. O-R-R-I-D-U-M. Oretum? Oretum. Oretum, yeah. Oretum. I, I don't know, many times, many times you think that it's uh, some wild species of animal or plant. Uh, <coughs> already distinct but we can we can find it if we careful look at and it's a good thing because we we can uh, still we still have the opportunity to to <coughs> do something to to conserve the species so i i, I think that autophyton oridum still uh occurs in nature but uh, we are keeping the range in secret like many other plants because uh, we are in the permanent and, uh, and uh, forever we will be fighting against the illegal Strachvins people. Because uh, uh, thinking, it's a, it's a good thing to think about because as uh, we had a question about the Amazon that ha have been destroyed and uh, is under fire, we have in, in, in in conservation biology, we have big problems like the uh, climate change, like the Amazon destruction, and we have uh, small problems that can be uh, cannot be compared with the big ones because sometimes the problem is the impact of strategies in a population of uh, a subspecies of an, uh, an ecotype of brubilid or orchid or cacti in uh, just at top of an iceberg and people say, oh, you're paying attention to that. Yeah, we are. We are trying to avoid these illegal people to promote the extinction because the extinction of, of wild species, wild varieties, wild subspecies have been uh, happening with the <coughs> family and cacti family for many decades. Oh, yeah. And now we have uh, bromeliads becoming more popular all over the world. And we have the Chilense genus under a serious threat because of the strategies. I mean, so it's very important to talk about it and to let people in the US and in Europe and in Asia, mainly in Asia right now, to do not buy plants that came from nature. And it's very easy to discover because uh, you just need to ask, is that new Chilense uh, undergrow whatever in the world? Chilense milagrensis, the plant that I discovered with Marilu in 1993, never have been uh, seriously uh, propagated in any place. So if you find this Chilense milagrensis in, in the commerce or in the internet, they came from nature. And we wanted these people to go to the jail, the people that are selling it, and uh, the Brazilian IBAMA, ICMBU, and state uh, police are looking for them because pe people are play paying uh, very poor this, this illegal and ethical uh, businessmen are paying uh, poor people all over Brazil, mainly in the northeastern region, to buy, to, to collect plants in nature. And these people are filling up many boxes every week with collected chilenses that go from, from that regions by trucks to the south. And uh, now that people from Ibama are searching for these illegal uh, businessmen, they are sending the trucks to other countries like Paraguay to go by plane to Asia. So it's very important hey, to talk about it. Pedro, part of the problem is that the prices that people will pay retail in Asia right now are through the roof. 
So it's very similar to, let's say, ivory or drugs. And uh, I don't know how we stop it, but uh, I've seen large, you know, large shipments of Poensis and of Kautskii that are clearly extracted plants, and they're getting $300 a plant in Asia. And it's just pure greed. I, I don't know how we stop it. I think that a good idea, Barry, is to have we people in the internet, in the social media of internet, talking yeah. about it and explain yeah. the new people, the new collectors, and the people that are not uh, understanding yet how serious this treat is uh, to wild species yeah. and how, how good opportunity is to make hybrids. I remember, I remember my friend, the late Wally Bear, uh, yeah. from Sarasota, Florida, talking with me in 1996 in Bahia, talking about the potential of, of hybridizing Chilanzia genius. And after that, after 25 years, we can see the huge hybrids that people are doing all over the world. So in this sense, I think that uh, hybridization and uh, nursery grow plants with that conversation in social, me social media will make the things more difficult for these illegal and ethical people. 